The museum building has housed the Department of Geology in Trinity for 160 years. The construction of the building began in 1853. Its exterior was fully completed by 1855, but the interior was only completed two years later. The building was designed by architects Thomas Dean and Benjamin Woodward, who also designed the famous Oxford Museum for Natural History. They took great influence from the Byzantine architecture of Venice. Carvings in the walls and pillars of both interior and exterior were precisely executed by two brothers from Cork named James and John O'Shea. The brothers collected fresh flowers to use and draw inspiration as their models for these carvings. An excerpt from Patrick Wise Jackson's A Victorian Landmark, Trinity College's museum building, states, It is said that they worked with materials gathered from the College Botanic Gardens in Ballsbridge. The keen eye may spot cats, snakes, frogs, squirrels, and birds lurking among shamrocks, daffodils, oaks, ivy, lilies, and acanthus." End quote. The Board of Trinity initiated a competition to design a building which would house geological and other collections. Almost 20 years later, in 1852, Dean and Wordwood's design for the building was chosen. Originally, there was a plan to have the interior decorated with frescoes by Rossetti. However, many of Dean and Wordwood's original designs for the interior were never executed. This is due to the college resident architect John McMurdy persuading the architectural team working on the building otherwise. The building is considered significant in the development of Gothic revival. However, it is often overlooked by many people due to its proximity to the Berkeley Library, where a sharp juxtaposition of old and new can be seen. Dean and Woodward focused on the textiles of the building, using a vast array of stones. The Industrial Revolution facilitated access to new sources of stones that were suitable building and decorative materials. The interior walls are faced with limestone. The pillars, banisters, and balustrades are made up of a range of Irish marbles and Cornish serpentines. The central staircase and floor of the upper balconies is made of Portland stone. The original floor was made of Yorkshire flagstone, more Portland stone, and Welsh pheffing stone. College records show that by as early as 1860, Dublin's smoggy atmosphere had already negatively affected the stone around the exterior of the building. In 2010, a three-year conservation project was put in place for the museum building. By 2013, many almost invisible carvings had been fully restored to their original state. As you approach the Trinity Museum building, one instantly notices the lively atmosphere on campus. From the pitch to the east to the main walking path that grazes the southern wall of the building, activity is bombarding the observer from every angle. The movement of people is also immediately felt with the football and rugby games, as well as guided tours and frantic trips to lectures, all unfolding within the walls of campus. Directly bordering the east wall of the building, a small rose garden acts as a brief repose from the activity surrounding it. Many students are seen here smoking, reading, or catching their breaths between classes. Benches border the inside of the garden in a semicircular shape, facing inwards and towards the museum building's imposing, towering walls.
During the busiest times, several of these benches are occupied by solitary activities, but the rose garden never seems to be crowded or overwhelmed. The shrubs, trees, and wrought iron fence that border the garden act as an insulating barrier by keeping the quiet in and harsh noises out. Sitting on the benches, one's gaze is naturally led to the gray granite chimneys of the museum building and the golden crab apples alongside other colorful trees directly in front of it. The building itself is a palazzo style, reminiscent of Venetian architecture. Symmetry and respect to the overall structure is a key aspect of the museum building. When looking at each side individually, the outer faces of the building appear perfectly symmetrical. The arched windows appear delicate next to the style of the rest of the structure through slim cuttings of timber framing paired with its thin vintage glass cut into six panes. Consisting of groupings of one to four, the windows surround the first and second floor, giving the appearance of a well-lit interior. On the far left and right sides of the ground floor, there is a triad of windows, followed by a pair of windows, then a singular window closest to the door. On the second floor, the same window pattern is used, except in the center, where an arched window replaces the door we see on the ground floor. A balustrade adjoining the three central windows on the northern and southern sides. At a glance, one notices the importance of arches as a theme for the design of this building. Above the entrance of each window sits separate large arches permeated with carvings. Each carving adorning the building is unique, being made up of images of leaves, trees, flowers, feathers, and other organic images. The multitude of limestone and granite that makes up the exterior looks quite worn. Over the years, the stone has darkened from rich off-white colors to a neutral gray. The pillars surrounding the exterior windows remain plain in comparison to the matching naturalistic carvings of the capitals that lay atop the pillars. The carvings are of incredible realism, the strikingly precise details of a variety of flora and fauna. The pillars on the second floor contain more detail, with a vine-like design running down each side. In between each section of windows lies a circular plaque made up of concentric circles, triangles, and indents, containing a marble pattern. The interior of the building has structural qualities of symmetry and balance that harmonize with its exterior. One does not notice the dissymmetry in carvings or room layout until they truly pay attention to the subtle nuances that the building has to offer. As one enters through the tall wooden double doors of the building, a soft creak emanates, continuing to echo through the interior's atrium. The few sounds within the building consist only of lingering footsteps, gentle whispers, or muffled lectures from behind thick closed doors. The foyer greets guests on either side with two proudly stood replicas of Irish elk skeletons which tower over the observer. Inside, there is minimal natural light imposed, giving the air and shadows inside an ominous quality. When looking straight ahead, one sees three archways connected to the floor by eight marble pillars, each decorated with ornate naturalistic capitals. Steps lead up through the middle archway into the main atrium of the building. Directly ahead sits an imperial staircase first traveling upwards, then unfolding to the left and right, the banisters of which are made up of rose and emerald colored marble, mirroring the pillars of the interior balustrades. Where the stairs divide, there's an enormous mechanical metronome centered against the wall, seeming to stare at the observer as they enter the building. Both sides of the building contain atrium overlooking mezzanines supported by two arched entranceways below. Naturalistic imagery is promoted by the design of the capitals crowning the marble-supportive pillars of these mezzanines. 
The arches themselves contain 17 red and white inlaid stones. Lining several of the upstairs walls are a number of portraits of professors, intellectuals, or other notable figures that have contributed to Trinity College. On each end of the mezzanines are doorways leading to lecture halls where the geology students of Trinity still attend. The pillars surmounting the mezzanines extend upward, drawing one's eye to the ceiling and natural light extending down from it. The only natural light that enters the main atrium is from two large glass and tile domes situated three stories above the ground floor. Surrounding the dome's cap of glasswork, there is a myriad of blue, red, and white enameled tiles inlaid to create a series of triangles radiating outward from the skylight. This is much similar to how the natural light enters the dome and the circular patterns adorning the exterior walls of the Trinity Museum building.